So first, thank you very much for John, uh, to John for inviting both of us here to the Earls Conference and to the wonderful city of Stockholm. We're both very pleased to be here. Uh, my name is Chris Evans. I lead security for the Chrome Open Source Browser and I guess the Google Chrome Browser that sits on, on top of that code base. I'm here with my colleague Ian Fetty. Good morning. My name is Ian Fetty. I'm a product manager on the Chrome team responsible also for security as well as our uh, web platform efforts, HTML5, all that good stuff. Excellent. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about the future of browser security. And Ian and I are both going to present a couple of different views on, if you like, perhaps what keeps us up at night, what, what problems we worry about and what problems we're constantly trying to solve on behalf of our users. Some of the material you hear today may be perhaps a slight departure from things you may normally hear about at the AWS conferences. Um, but I've decided to go this route because for me, this is very much a focus on, on what's real. Uh, very much a focus on where the worst damage that I personally see day to day happening to users out there on the internet is. So this introduction will be old news for I'm sure all of you, but um, we, we really are in a war and um, the browser is one of the fronts on this war, on the browser ecosystems. Um, it didn't used to be this way. Um, not that many years ago, security was, was somewhat different. You would, uh, as an organization, you'd have a, a large firewall. You would expose a few services from that firewall and attackers would try and break in through these services. Um, and times have changed. Now, um, we still have firewalls, but it's getting very hard to directly break into someone through the server side. Um, so there's definitely been a focus towards the client side attacking web browsers and the applications that people are running on their desktop and attacking, of course, the web applications themselves. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, about what changes we've seen in terms of the defenses over the past few years and then the attacks that have adapted to those defenses and then sort of look at the, the most recent changes that have been going on and, and how everything is adapting today and also a little bit into the future. So here's an overview of what we're going to talk about. Um, we're going to briefly cover what the browser ecosystem is and what threats there are against it. Um, we're going to cover some developments that have been going on within that ecosystem. Um, I'm going to take a little detour into, into plugins and you'll, you'll, it'll be very apparent why I do that as, as I present the story through my slides. Um, and I'll look to the future to see what trends we might see in terms of defenses deployed and then how malware might react to that. And do you want to just cover the, mention the things you'll be... Sure, and I'm gonna, so after Chris talks about how we're hardening the browser, I'm gonna talk about how we use uh, blacklisting sort of as a defense in depth mechanism, uh, as well as some new surface areas that browsers are exposing to attack that I think are likely going to be the source of uh, new vulnerabilities in years and months to come. Okay, so here's my attempt to graphically represent what, what quotes the, the browser ecosystem looks like. Um, and at the top, you, you pick whatever one of the major five or, or other browser suits your needs the best. And that's just a small part of the story nowadays. Um, sitting beneath that browser that you've picked is, is literally this, this spray of plugins. Um, a lot of users will have all of these plugins available on their machine. Uh, some users won't, but uh, as you can see that some of these plugins the size of the plugin doesn't necessarily denote anything in particular, but um, some of those, even the smaller icons on this graphic, represent a very large plugin in terms of sheer functionality that an evil web page can, can experiment with and try and abuse to damage a machine. And also, perhaps overlooked, we also have system and network libraries that are used by these browsers. Um, I'm going to do a quick show of hands just for my own interest. I'm, I'm always curious when I visit a given conference venue what the distribution is of who uses what browser. Um, and you can vote more than once. So I just want, just curious, who uses Internet Explorer? Um, I'm very bad at tallying percentages. Let's say that's a two out of five in terms of enthusiasm. Um, how about Firefox? It's a four out of five in terms of enthusiasm. Excellent. Uh, Safari? One and a half out of five. Uh, Opera? One and a half out of five, and Chromium or Chrome? About a, about a three, maybe. Excellent. So, in terms of these, these pieces here, what threats can they pose to you as a user of these pieces? 
And I tend to split these up into three threats. And I'm going to go in reverse order here. Um, so on number three is what I call web app-based leaks. So this, this is threats whereby, whereby the facilities provided by the browsers and by the plugins simply aren't very conducive to building a robust, a robust web application on top of them. Um, I'm not going to cover so much about that today. Um, number two is very interesting. I'm going to dwell on this a bit before moving on. And this is cross-origin data theft. And of course, we're very used to this attack in web applications. We see cross-site cross scripting, cross-site request vulnerabilities, uh, sorry, cross-site request forgery vulnerabilities on, on a daily basis. And um, it's very often in terms of website X has a cross-site scripting vulnerability in this piece of functionality. Um, what's interesting to me is that recently I've been working a lot on cross-origin data theft issues, but whereby the actual bug for these has been in the browser or in one of the plugins in the browser ecosystem that we saw. And that's interesting to me because these bugs are real and there's, there's been a lot of them discussed recently and we may even have some new disclosures today in some of, some of the talks later on today in this area. But um, it's very unusual that you see one of these bugs cause user damage, get used to worm something. And that's interesting because if you have an application specific cross-site scripting, um, that obviously you can damage one particular application. But if you have a browser or a plugin enabled cross-site scripting, you can take your pick of any web application you want to worm or, or do something else with. And, I, and I'm not really seeing much of that going on. And I'd love to talk to some of you later about why you think that may be. So moving on to what I'm going to uh, focus on um, is the threat of arbitrary code execution. So this is where you visit either an evil website, or maybe it's a good website but it's been compromised, or it's a good website but the advertising network you know, is, is serving up some drive by download. Um, the threat here is that you visit this evil website and it compromises your machine via either a bug in the browser or, or some other part of the, the ecosystem that we saw earlier. And, and that's obviously really bad because once someone has control of your local machine, they can do anything, and that includes web attacks. You know, um, they don't need to cross-site script you if they have your local machine. They can just log your passwords as you log into your bank, and that's obviously that's obviously a very bad attack. And we're seeing it's the majority of the damage I see in the wild. We have botnets with you know three million machines in, and when any one of anyone on one of those three million machines logs into that machine to their bank, you know their banking password is sent off to someone and sold credit cards lost. So this is, a, this is a huge issue. Um, I've split arbitrary code execution down in, into three types. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail other than to say that the, what you don't want is unsandboxed arbitrary code execution. If you have unsandboxed arbitrary code execution, it means that one bug gets you complete control of someone's machine and, and that's game over. What we'd really like to see is a little bit more sandboxing and we're going to go on to that shortly. So just to sort of set the story on how attacks have been sort of shifting in direction and focus, um, if we look maybe 15 years ago or so, things were very different. Um, I, I quite clearly remember I was, uh, I was in an office with some colleagues, and these colleagues were emailing around executables. And these executables would do something, maybe it's Christmas, it'd make like a little reindeer dance across your screen. It was very pretty. And this was 15 years ago, and, and what was interesting about this time 15 years ago is the reindeer would dance across the screen and it wouldn't actually compromise your machine as well in the background. So it used to be the case that you really could email executables to each other and no one would do bad things to you. Um, of course, very quickly that became a, a vector for malware distribution. And we sort of got that problem under control with these bullet points here. We have email clients that don't really let you email executables to each other so much anymore. That's both the web ones and the client side ones. Um, if you try and download an executable from the web in a modern operating system such as uh, Windows 7, you'll get a, a whole ton of dialogues trying to stop you from doing that. If you click through them, we've now got protected mode execution such that that executable will run with lower privileges. Um, organizations deploy admin control so that you just, you just can't run executables that come from the web. Antivirus enhancements and so on and so on. So that forced attackers to change their focus. And until recently, their focus was very much in exploiting a web browser. That means they find a bug in your web browser, somehow get you to visit an evil site or serve up an evil ad, and bang, they compromise your machine via a, bug, a single bug in your web browser. Um, and in terms of making the situation better here, the, the ball was started rolling by Microsoft when they released uh, 
the browser Internet Explorer 7 on the Windows Vista platform and obviously newer combinations also have this. And they introduced a protective mode sandbox such that any single bug in the browser that gets code execution on the machine runs in a, that code execution runs in a very limited capacity such that the installation of persistent malware is, um, is, is actually very difficult to do. And that was a huge boost in security. Um, other browsers that have gone this route, um, Chromium on, on XP has a, had a file system sandbox on, on Vista and newer. We threw in the protective mode sandbox as well because the facility was there. Um, and also, this is very operating system dependent, but we, we found a way to apply sandboxing to the browser on both the Linux and the Mac ports as well now. So just to sort of pictorially illustrate what sandboxing in a browser might look like, we have, have this image here that we, um, we released as part of the Google Chrome prom, uh, comic when we released Google Chrome itself. Um, and the important thing to note here is, is um, the screen's so large, I can't actually point at it very easily, but the Chrome process about halfway up, that's, that's running outside of a sandbox, and it ha it's a very small piece of code, and it sort of handles things like loading files from the local disk and saving files from the web to the local disk. Obviously, you, you can't do that from within a sandbox. Um, but all of the hard work of rendering a web page, running JavaScript, doing all of the horrible, complicated things that can and very do often go wrong from a security point of view, these are done down here in the bottom of this diagram in, in a sandbox. So any, any bugs within those pieces, the impact of those is, is mitigated such that it's very hard for the installation of persistent malware. Um, one of the main challenges with this picture is, um, is the pieces to the top right, which represent uh, the plugins, which we, if you saw a picture of all, all the plugins earlier that run within the browser environment. Um, some of these just don't work if you just throw them inside a sandbox, um, which presents some problems that I'll come on to shortly. Uh, more recent changes that have been changing the focus of attackers is, is auto-updating users. So it was sort of heading towards a world where people, after the initial debate, are seeing this as somewhat required for good security. And significant projects that you will have heard of that are on board include Microsoft Windows, the entire operating system is under an auto-update capability. Uh, there's Google Chrome, uh, Firefox, very good success in this area. And some recent great news, April 2010, uh, the Adobe Reader plugin, uh, auto updated came out of beta. So that, that's great news in terms of keeping users up to date and therefore lowering Windows opportunity to exploit bugs. Um, just to show you some of the success of auto updates in terms of a few graphs, uh, what we have here is a graph that represents over time what percentage of your user base is up to date? What percentage of your user base has the latest security packs that you've just released that you want everyone to be protected by? And as you can see, uh, the top row represents Chrome and Firefox, both of which have a good, a good auto update story. And you can see a very sharp curve in terms of patch release, users getting protected quickly. So if we take all of this, the the fact that you can't just email someone an executable and have, them ex and have them run it for you so easily anymore. The fact that software is being kept more up to date. The fact that browsers are getting more and more sandboxed, more and more hardened. What does this mean for where attackers are focusing here and now in the present day? And what we're seeing is a very large attacker focus on, on plugins in the browser ecosystem. So at this point, some stats might be quite interesting. So these are some stats recently taken uh, for the Google Chrome 4.1 browser in terms of what percentage of our, of our user base has a given plugin installed. So 97% Adobe Flash, no surprise, widely known as the most uh, widely installed plugin. 86% uh, Adobe Acrobat, that's the PDF reader. 66% uh, have the Java plugin, which is still very, very popular. Um, we're still investigating if this is an anomaly or not, but it seems that the up-to-datedness of, of, of that, users of that plugin was, was very low. Um, that's quite worrying. We're, going, we're looking into what we can do there. And then down towards the 50%, some other very popular plugins that, that a large number of, of users have installed. So I just did some searching around in the news to see where